Plan, bulletin, pin. Let me see your Bibles this evening. There we go. It's the only one that's really important. Open your Bible, please, to Matthew. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, one of the four Gospels, Matthew 22. Matthew is my favorite book of the Bible. He's also my favorite disciple because Matthew was a tax collector. He was known as a sinner, and a tax collector was basically meant he was part of the Jewish mafia, and he would take the money uh, for the Romans, and he would take a bunch for himself and turn it back in, and, and people despised tax collectors and hated them. And one day, after doing this for his whole life, Jesus came to him, and he just said, follow me, and he left it all behind, and he followed him. So he's always been my favorite person in the Bible. I always start my messages um, with Matthew. Matthew 22, verse 36 says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Or no, it starts in 36. It says, teacher, which is the most important commandment of the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Everything, the entire law, everything in the Bible is based on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And the other one that's just as important is love your neighbor as yourself. That's all. It's it. It's right there. Thank you for coming out this evening. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. That's it. That's the whole message to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. If you're filling in your blanks, number one, the only things that matter in this life are our relationships. Our relationships. That's it. Your relationships with God, with others, and with yourself. And if you're like me, you read this and you think, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. How do you do that? What does that even look like? Your relationship with God, others, and yourself is the only thing that matters in this life. Um, I, I did a funeral a, a while back, and I've done a bunch of funerals. And every time, no one ever talks about the person's money. No one ever talks about their accomplishments. No one ever talks about anything but their relationship, about, how, about the times that they did this and the times that they did that and the things that they did together. That's all that people remember you by, and that's all, that's all that matters is your relationship with others. If you're filling in your blanks, love is spelled... T-I-M-E. You want to love God and love your neighbors? The first thing we got to do is ask ourselves, what do we do with our most valuable resource? Okay? Money is replaceable. Things are replaceable. Our time, once it's gone, once today is gone, we will never have it again. It's irreplaceable. You know, the Bible says your heart is where your treasure is. Okay, we always assume that means money, but we have something more valuable than money is, is your time. And if you want to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, what do you do with your time? How much time do you spend with God? How much time do you spend serving others? Or do you spend the time on yourself, with your relationship with yourself? The Bible says in James that our life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. That morning fog, the specific word talks about that breath. You know, in the morning when it's cold, when you blow it out, that's what the Bible says our life is like. It's here for a little time, and it's short. My question for you and my question for me is how much of our time do we spend doing this, doing these, this one commandment, love God and loving others? Turn, if you could, to almost the end of the Bible, 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. It's almost near Revelation. And John explains to us a little bit what it means to love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul. Now, John was one of the three disciples that were closest to Jesus. There was three that were really close to him, and then he had the whole 12. The, the Bible says it's, it's the one that Jesus loved. He's the only one who died a natural death. He didn't get crucified or killed. He lived to an old age. He's the one that wrote Revelation. And he wrote this, some say after, but they definitely know that this was wrote, written when he was old. And if you read the Gospel of John, it's real feel good and warm and fuzzy and talks about Jesus being the Son, the way, the truth, and the life. This one's a little more hardcore. This one just nails you right where, where, where the church needed to be nailed when they, when they preached it. And when he put this out, he put this out specifically 
for the church. He was also actually a pastor at a church in Ephesus that Paul started when he was older. And he used to come out once a week when he was really old. And he'd come out and he would say this. He would say, little children, love one another. And then, then he would go away. And I thought, man, that's what I'm going to do when I get old. That would be smooth. Just roll out, get everyone here. Glad you guys all got in your cars, came over here, and just say, little children, love one another. And then roll out. That would be smooth <laughs> to be able to do that. But let's look what he says in, in chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5 says, This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, then we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. If you're filling your blanks, loving God starts with asking for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness. It has to all start right there. Otherwise, why, why are we here? Why do we need God? If we, don't need, if we don't need forgiveness, if we're already okay. It starts with taking an honest look at ourselves and saying, God, forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm not walking in the light. I want to walk in the light, in fellowship with you. Now, we'll read on. In verse 2, then it says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for all our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure, and here it is, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly, truly show how completely they love him. That is how they know that we are loving him, living in him. Those who say they should live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, here's where we run into a little bit of problem. And uh, I got to tell you right now, I always teach what it is that I need to learn. So this obedience thing is what God is, 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 is teaching me. Some of us need to hear this because the Bible says in Galatians, it says, don't be misled. You cannot mock God. You can't fool God. You'll always harvest what you plant. You know, literal translation, nowadays I would say, God's not a punk. Okay, you can't act like, you know, ah, you know, may maybe God doesn't know, he, you know, he and hang on to what, whatever it is that you want to hang on to and walk in the darkness. And when I talk about obedience, I'm not talking about obedience because God's going to punish you. I'm talking about this, obeying this one commandment, loving God with all your heart and your soul and love your neighbor yourself because that's what it means to walk in the light, not because what God is going to do is punish us. And some of us need to hear this. Definitely the Rock Church needs to hear this. I talk to a lot of people. I do a lot of counseling. I handle a lot of phone calls. And we are a group of people in particular that we like to walk in the dark and hold on to this, some of this stuff and, and think that God's just going to be, just going to be okay. You know, a lot, a lot of people that come to the Rock Church still sleep with their girlfriend or boyfriend, sex outside of marriage. Okay. Keep coming back to the rock, but you're walking in darkness, okay? Don't tell other people the rock church is your church if you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You're giving God a bad name. You're walking in darkness, okay? There's people who come to the rock church that still practice homosexuality. Keep coming to the rock church, but you're walking in darkness, okay? You're walking in darkness. Some of us here, we think it's okay to drink and do drugs and do whatever we want to do and go out womanize. And then come into the rock and kind of have that smirk that, you know, we come here for the feel good. Keep coming back, but know that you're walking in darkness. Okay, God wants you to walk in the light. And again, it has nothing to do with, with, with the punishment, with what God's going to do if you don't. It has more to do with, with, with wanting to be in fellowship with God. Some of you don't even know that you can't stop doing what has you in the darkness. Some of you need to get to a point where you say, you know what, I don't want to walk in the darkness anymore and try and walk away. And then you realize, uh-oh, I'm stuck. Some of you cannot walk away from sexual immorality. 
and you don't even know it yet, and you won't know it till you try it. Some of you cannot walk away from drugs and alcohol, and you don't even know it, and you won't know until you try. Some of you can't walk away from whatever's got you stuck in the darkness until you realize you can't do it on your own, and you say, God, because look right here what it says, if we, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need God to cleanse us, to be able to walk in light. We can't do it on our own. We just can't. And again, it's not because, for me, the, 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 the fear of hell and God's wrath, it should scare me. But it doesn't. It doesn't. For some reason, I want to walk in the light of God. I've never been one that's really scared of the consequences. I've seen a glimpse of what it's like to walk in God's light, and that's what, what, I, what I want. You know, that's where I want to remain. But I realize I'm stuck in all these darkness things. Now, again, I always teach what it is that, that I need to learn. And, and uh, uh, you know, obedience, obey, for me, it's a four-letter word. You know, it's not, not, I don't have the spiritual gift of, uh, uh, of obedience. Um, I've never, you know, it's not natural for me. I, I'm not inclined to be obedient. Every time I get a rule from, from the world, the first thing that goes through my mind is, is why is this a rule? And, and what happens if I don't follow this rule? And can they really make me follow this rule? Because if they can't make me, chances are, unless I feel like it, I'm probably not going to go with the, with the flow of that. I'm not talking about that kind of obedience. I'm talking about obedience to God that just says, hey, I want to walk in the, in the sunshine. God, in my house growing up, when I was a kid, growing up in uh, South Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Anybody from Nebraska? Anybody get a, a Yahoo? All right, here we go. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, <laughs> when I was growing up in my household, there was obedience, okay? If, if, especially if my dad was home. You know, it was, it, was, it was one of those things where you just, you respected your parents, period. Or there would be, there would be consequence. I mean, if I, if I even went like that to my dad, it would be like, Boy, did you just smack your lips at me? Instantly, I would know, you know, the, the result of, of whether that was okay or not. And you know what? I'm glad for that because that's probably the only thing that kept me from, you know, nowadays, I mean, we didn't have, they didn't have child protective services in Nebraska <laughs> or anything like that. It, it wasn't like my parents said, oh, you're going to take a time out. You know, we're going to have you, you sit in the corner and do something. Nowadays, it's like they're trying to make it like throw you in jail if you spank your kids, which is to me the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. I would have been in trouble had my dad and not at least had, had I not had that one person in my life who could tell me what to do that I, that I wouldn't back talk to. You know, outside the house, it was a little bit different because, you know, Pops is not around. I'm free. You know, I could do whatever I want. I didn't have quite the same respect for the other authority. And the police, you know, growing up, they'd put you in a little timeout every once in a while. <laughs> lock the door for a little bit. And, um, you know, I remember the first time I got arrested, I was 12 years old. And uh, I was stealing some candy bars. I remember there were king-size crunches <laughs> from the uh, uh, convenience store. I remember there was three of them. And the uh, police took me down, and they, they locked me in a cell. 12 years old, locked me in the cell, walked in the other room, they came back out. And I was thinking, even at the time, I was thinking, I'm 12. I already know they ain't going to keep me here. And, and my, my thing that I'm thinking is I'm saying, hey, is there some way this can go down without letting my parents know? Is there anything I could do? I'm sorry. <laughs> I started realizing where this was going. The, the whole lockup, jail, you know, that didn't, it was, it was what's going to happen when I get home? This is not going to end well. If we could somehow just, if we could find my mom and talk to her first, it would up my <laughs> chances of survival. It just wasn't gonna, it just wasn't gonna end good. Well, we went home and the, the, the cop had coffee with my parents for about an hour and I'm, I'm upstairs in my room and I'm, and I'm, I'm like, you know, just waiting. It's, it's coming. And, and it, it didn't come that night. And then the next day, you know, nothing, nothing. And, and I'm scared to come out of my room and it's literally like uh, Saturday morning at like 3 in the afternoon. I'm starting to get hungry. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I'm, you know, I come out and I, and, and I run across my, my pops. And, and you know what he said? He said, uh, I'm so ashamed of you. I can't even look at you. Don't even come near me. Stay away from me. You're not, you're not even part of this family. Uh, you know what? I can handle the, the whooping. 
I could handle and deserve the whooping. That was fine. Let's get it over with. But for him to say, you know what? You're not part of what, what we are here. This is not how we roll in our family. You're, 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 you're cast out. This is what it means to me to have obedience. I want to be like this with God. I don't want to be separated, not because of the punishment, because I just don't want to break that fellowship. You know, it happened a, f- it happened a few times actually growing up, little timeouts here and there. <laughs> and one time I remember uh, we used to steal jeans from Brandeis, this department store. We'd put on a bunch of pair and, and run out. And one time I put on like five pair. And, and I mean, you can tell by looking at me, I'm quick, you know, <laughs> run like a deer. Well, at, the, at this time, I had five pairs of pants on. It was like running in moon things. And usually they didn't chase us, but this time they went ahead and chased me and caught me. And, uh, you know, when they, everyone knew my dad. He was a, a captain on the fire department. It was a small community. So this time when they locked me up, you know, and they used to stretch out the times that they would leave me in there a little longer and a little longer. And this time, the, uh, uh, the jail, guy, jail guard, whatever, came to me and said, is there someone else we could call? Because uh, your dad said just to leave you here. You know what? That hurt. That hurt. That hurt more than all, than all the whoopings I got. And when I left there, I went to Las Vegas, and, and I, I lived for years just on the, on the south, on the, on the dark side. And, and what hurt me most was knowing that I was, had broken fellowship with my family, that, they were, that that was not a part. I was not welcome in their, in their house anymore because of my lifestyle. This this is what it means to be obedient, not because we all have this, God's going to strike you down. It's not about God striking down. It's about God wanting to be, wanting you to be in fellowship with him. Um, you know, we've since reconciled, obviously, and I'm very close to my parents. I, I, I really love my parents, and it, we're still fundamentally different, me and my dad, and, and I, I have to say that I teach, I say this again, and I'll say it all night, I teach what it is I learn, what I need to learn. And what God's trying to really show me is my views on this obedience and about, about, about how, what it truly means to obey. He, he, got a, 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 he didn't do something, he wasn't going to go somewhere because he got uh, jury duty, sent him a thing for jury duty. And I was like, that's just, that's an urban folk tale. That's a, you don't really get arrested for not showing up for that. You know, so you, you just throw those away and go on. And, uh, and you know what my dad said? He said, uh, uh, he said, you know what, Tommy? Sometimes people just do what they're supposed to do. I was like, man, where did I come from? What, 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 could, he be, what could he be talking about? You know, so I, I teach what it is that I need to learn, what God's trying to show me. And I know God is, and, and it's not because of the consequences, you know, it's just I know God is, is, is trying to show me something in my life. Um, this is something that's kind of funny. On Thursday, um, I got pulled over by a motorcycle cop. And I know, very funny. <laughs> the funny thing about it is this has happened three times. Three times, like within a week of, of whenever I preach. For some reason, it's obviously not my fault. It's obviously something in the universe. I end up getting pulled over. And here's where it gets worse. I didn't get a ticket. Thank you, God. But what I got was um, he thought that I was kind of crowding him in the lane or whatever. I was obviously, again, absolutely not in the wrong, not even this much. But he came to my pastor's window and started scolding me for like five minutes straight. He was yelling at me. And about two minutes into it, I started thinking, can you just give me the ticket? I mean, is, do, I have to, do I have to take this? I was like, God, what is, what is God trying to show me? I don't even know what that means or what that fits in, but I know that's got to be a coincidence that the last three times I got pulled over was right before I preached. So where were we? <laughs> Let's turn to, uh, oh, same, same place. Let's skip up to uh, verse 7. It says, John says, Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you, rather an old one that you have heard from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. 
Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by darkness. If you're filling in your blanks, number five, hate will cause you to be blinded by darkness. You cannot walk in God's spirit, in God's light, and have hate in your heart, and have anger, and have resentment. It just doesn't work. It has to be, it has to be out there. Matthew even takes it a step further and says, if you're presenting a sacrifice or a gift at the altar, and you suddenly remember someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come offer your sacrifice to God. So if you're coming to church, and you're like, here I am, Lord, and you're lifting up holy hands, and you know that someone else, not even you're mad at them, they have something against you, the Bible says when it comes to loving others, go out and fix that. You have no business being here. Go out and fix that. Be reconciled to your brother and then come back. You cannot walk in God's light and hold on to resentment and hold on to hate. And some of you, again, this is not like something you can just say, oh, I didn't know that. Well, I'll just let it go and I'll go. You need to sometimes, you'll have to say, you'll have to go back to this verse and say, God, this is sin for me. And, you know, here's the thing. It doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. That doesn't matter at all. You can't hold on to it even if you're 100% right. You've got to let go of whatever that bitterness, whatever that anger is, if you truly want to have fellowship with God and walk in the light. Um, It says right here, if you confess your sins, God will not only forgive you, but he'll cleanse you. You say, God, this is sin. Show me how to let this go. It's another one of those things that, Some of us don't even know that we can't let go of the anger and the resentment and the bitterness. That resentment, that anger, that hate, that will kill you. It will kill you spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. It will kill you. Your quality of life is a direct proportion of what state you're in all day on a daily basis. If you're going through your life filled with hate, filled with anger, you cannot have a quality of life. And not not only that, you cannot walk in the spirit of, uh, of God. There was one time... In Las Vegas, <laughs> they had put me in a little time out there in Vegas as well <laughs> for something I didn't do, <laughs> which was pretty much the case every time. But this time, um, I was uh, living in Las Vegas for about a year, and I was, I was living large. I was living in one of those pay-by-week hotels. You know, I was on top of the world. Uh, and and I, I remember thinking, man, I need a break from, from this. I was doing drugs and drinking and into crime and just out of control and thinking, I'm going to die really fast if I don't take a time out and, and, and take a break from this. And I went back home from Thanksgiving to Christmas because it was, it was just too much for me. And, and when I left, I turned the keys over to the, the other tweakers that were living with me at the place. And I went back home and the place was registered in my name. So while I was there, this one guy, I'm not going to mention his name, George, he, uh, he robbed the security guard for a watch and a ring and, and, and took off. And, and it was my name on the thing, so he put the two and two together, and, and somehow the warrant got put out for me for doing that. And then when I was back living in Vegas, doing my thing, the, the you know, police obviously were still discriminating against me and wanting me to stop being around the, the drug areas. And then he said, when he pulled me over and checked my ID, he said, oh, you've got also a uh, warrant for, uh, uh, for armed robbery. I was like, Phew. You must be kidding me. You got the wrong person. And uh, so they put me in their little area where they hold me. And uh, I'm looking at the papers a few days later, and I realize I'm not even, I wasn't even in town when this happened. So I'm telling the guard, I'm like, good news. I wasn't even here. You got the wrong guy. You know, turns out everybody says that <laughs> when they're in jail. They don't really care about that. And this long time started to pass where I'm in there for something someone else did. And I started getting filled with hatred and bitterness and anger. And if I look back on my whole life, that year after that was the blackest, darkest year ever. I could remember at points, because I wanted to kill this guy, because I was in jail for something he did. And I can remember being so filled with hate and in my mind thinking, when did this happen? When did I get so filled with all this rage and this anger and this hate? And even now, even now, as we're Christians, you, me, I know what's down that dark alley. Anger for me is poison. 
Hatred is poison. Resentment is poison. I know what's going down. If I even start to go down there, I can't let it be. I cannot walk in the spirit of God. I cannot serve God and serve others if I hold on to that. And the same, same is true with you. And it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. You must get rid of that or it kills you. You must ask God, God, help me get rid of this. I know, you know, for me, one way that, 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 that works for me, if you want to get rid of it, I write it all down. I write it on a piece of paper because I usually find out if I'm mad at one person, I'm usually mad at just about everybody, which lets me know that it's usually me. I write it all down and it does a couple things. Number one, I see that this stuff's all controlling my life. All these people are controlling my life. And I'll share it with another person. I'll ask God. I'll beg God, remove this from me. And, I, and I'll tear it up. And I don't know how it works. And I don't know why it works. But I know this verse, when I confess my sins, God's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all wickedness and cleanse my heart. And I'm able to walk back in the light. And see, again, hundreds of times, it's not about being punished. It's that I've had a glimpse of what it's like to walk in God's light. And I want to stay there. And the world keeps on dragging me away and taking me to other places. Skip up a couple verses to verse 15. Now, if you realize this, this first John, it, it lays out the whole gospel. It, it, it starts off with, with forgiveness, where it always begins, is us seeing our heart. Then it talks about Jesus paying the price for those sins. Then it talks about walking in obedience. Then it talks about loving your brother, loving one another. And then it goes on. And this one, this is the tough one. This is the final frontier. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is what I believe primarily holds me and keeps me from, from serving God and serving others. Verse 15 says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. If you're filling in your blanks, number six is a love God hates. There is a love that God hates, and it's a love of the world. A love God hates is a love of the world. If you want to love God, if you want to follow this one and only commandment, here's what you have to do. You have to stop loving yourself. You have to stop serving yourself. You know, this is what cuts us off. This selfishness is what cuts us off from the Spirit of God. And when I ask you what you do with your time, you know, in a minute I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give, to give you a, a, a homework assignment for the week to really start to look at where does my time go? Does it go for, for others or, or does it go for myself? Love yourself, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. You know, someone said, and what's funny is, is, all day long, people have been coming up to me after service and, 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 and like want, wanting to not argue this point, but just saying, God wants me to love myself. God wants, where is it in the Bible? Someone said, well, it's in there. It says, to thine own self be true. Oh, where that comes from, it's not, it's not in the Bible. We're to love God and love others. Now, it presupposes that we love ourselves because it says, love your neighbors as you love yourself because God already knows we're looking out for number one for ourselves. We're supposed to love him like, like, we're, like we love others. In James 4, you don't have to turn there, but look what James says. He says, what's causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? Within you, your own selfishness? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. The core of all my problems is my selfishness. The core of all your problems is your selfishness. If, you, if you're mad, if you're ever mad, it's because something didn't go the way you think it should go. If you're upset, it's because the world didn't go the way you feel like it should go. Um, who do we spend? Who do I spend? And again, I teach what it is that I need to learn. Who do we spend most of our time serving? Where does most of our, our time go? I know for me, the selfishness, you know, this is a big part of me teaching what it is that I need to learn. You know, I, I'll be the first to admit that I'm always on my mind. You know, I'm my favorite topic. And everything that comes at me in life, the first thing that goes is, how, whoa, how does this affect me? How does this affect my life? Look what it says in verse 16. It breaks up those three things. It talks about the craving for physical pleasure or the lust of the flesh. That means your lust for sex, for drugs, whatever makes your body feel good, for, for power, that lust of the flesh, 
We can't walk in the Spirit until we address this. The Bible says we have to crucify our flesh. We have to die to ourselves, that God is the only thing in us that, that, that's good, that we can live for. The craving for everything we see, which is the lust of the eyes. And man, we live right now in a world and a time where toys are, are everywhere. I mean, I can think of like the top 100 things that I want. The world is filled with stuff that just, wow, to fill that lust of the eyes. And then the big one, I believe, pride in our achievements, or some of your versions say the pride of life. Pride of life. The Bible says God hates pride. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God hates pride. The first sin was what? When Adam and Eve ate the apple, right? Wrong. Wrong. The first sin was when Lucifer, who was the top angel, decided, hey, you know what? I can be like God. Pride. That pride was the original, original sin, and he tempted Adam and Eve. He said, I can be like God. God hates pride. We have now, because of our sinful nature, we have ingrained in us this need for significance, this desire that we should be significant, that, that, that drives us. And if you listen for it in your own words, in everyone's words, you'll hear it all week long. People relentlessly will come up and tell you what they're doing, what I'm doing. You'll find yourself start letting people know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Everything you say, so you start to realize, wow, I do build myself a lot. In the Christian community, we do a lot of, uh, you know, we mask it as, let me just share with you what God's doing in my life. And then they, boom, go into the whole significance. I have a lot of people come to me and say, I got to get to Miles to tell him what God's doing. No, nah, that's just your need for, for significance. You feel like you, you got to be part of this. The Bible doesn't have anything to say about us needing to be significant. The Bible talks plenty about God loving us None about us, us loving ourselves and our need for significance. And again, I teach what it is I need to learn. Uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking, you know, about what others think of us. You know, you spend a lot of time thinking what other people are thinking about you. And what you don't realize is, is ain't nobody thinking about you. <laughs> ain't nobody thinking about me. We think they are. We think they're thinking this, that they're thinking about themselves. Nobody thinks about you as much as, as, as you think they do. And if, if they were, who cared? But the, the fact is, you know, we spend, we're always, all of us, we're always on our mind looking at how life affects us. Now, I have a question for you because um, our key is going to be to start to loving God and loving others is going to have to be for us to realize, wow, I, I do spend too much time serving myself. I don't spend any of my time serving God or serving others, or I need to spend more time serving God and serving others. And it, and it, it takes action. It takes, it takes for us, uh, uh, takes for us you know, to, to actually do something, not just think about it, not just pray about it. Um, I'm going to read you a couple verses. These are actually uh, it's right afterwards. They're bonus verses. No extra charge for this little nugget. Actually, maybe we will take another offering because this one's going to be good. <laughs> no, just kidding. It says, it goes on, it says, John says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have already heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know the last hour has come. Now, you've heard about uh, 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 Antichrist, probably. And, and some of you have this idea that it's this person that will rise up to power in Revelation or something like that or whatever MTV or, or whatever the movies have told you the Antichrist is. Do you know the Antichrist is only mentioned here? That's it. And the Antichrist, and it defines what it is in 22. It says, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an Antichrist. Anyone who says Jesus is not the Christ is an Antichrist according to the Bible. Anyone. Now, does our society have a lot of people who say that Jesus is not, is not the Christ? I mean, our whole society sometimes will say Jesus is not the Christ. There's very influential people that will tell you Jesus is not the Christ. And I'm not going to mention any names, Oprah. <laughs> but if it doesn't affect you or scare you or make you think that where our world's going, when you have very powerful, influential people saying, hey, Jesus is great, but he's not the only way. Jesus is not the only way. You know, the culture, the culture tells us there's other ways. To thine own self be true. You know, be true to yourself. Be nice to yourself. You have your own flesh 
that's telling you, serve yourself. You have the enemy telling you, serve yourself. You have the whole society telling you, serve yourself. The only one that's telling you to serve God and serve others is God. We have all these forces going against us. And I know some of this stuff, it sounds unreasonable. It sounds unreasonable for, you know, it's a good message to say, love yourself. It feels good. When you start to tell me that loving myself is the problem, that's, that's not a good message for me. You know, the whole world tells me it's different than that. It sounds unreasonable. You know, unreasonable people are the ones that shape the world. You know, Jesus was unreasonable in what he said. Don't get caught up in the hypnosis of what the culture is telling you and what the world is telling you and what, what people that are anti-Christ, anti-Jesus are telling you. To go this way, just do, just do, your, own, do your own thing. You know, the good news for me and for you is God knows our hearts. Okay, when you ask God to show you your heart and he shows you your heart truly, um, the other thing he'll do is he'll also show you his grace. He'll show you his grace and what, because where sin abounds, grace abounds more. I'm going to read to you something that Paul wrote in uh, Romans. Now, Paul was, was arguably the greatest apostle of all. I mean, he wrote over half the New Testament. He was the man. You know, he was smart. He was, he was, he was just the man. He was, he was chosen by God. Look what he writes. Paul says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for, what I, want, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one who's doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But I do what I don't want to do. I am not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul, the greatest apostle of all, if he struggled with sin and wanted to live in the light but kept getting pulled in the darkness, how much more are we? You're not going to be able to be sin free until we have our glorified body, until we, until we leave this, this earth. There will always be this struggle. But what God wants to know is what's your heart? What is your heart? Do you want to be holy? Is this something you desire? Because here's the thing. If you are mocking God, just saying, I'm good, I don't need to be, you need to question yourself if you're really in the faith. Because if you've truly accepted Christ in your heart, you will have the Spirit of God in you that desires to be holy. You will have that war with your flesh. It won't just be, I'm good, me and God are good. You'll want to be holy. You'll have had that glimpse of the light and want to go towards that. And my prayer for you, and, and the question I have for you this week, and, and my encouragement for you, is this is going to take... You know, uh, and, and again, this is, this is us trying to walk in the light. This is not me trying to tell you how to walk in the light. This is us trying to truly say, God, I want to love you with all my heart, my mind, and my soul. I didn't even realize I had so much in, in stuck to me. I, I want you to forgive me. I want you to cleanse me. I want to walk in this light. I want to do that. And it starts with us saying, first of all, is this true? Is this really where we're at. And my question for you this week, and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit asks you this question all week long, all week long. My question that I want you to ask everything you do, every thought you think, every move you make, I want this question to go through your head. Who is this for? Who is this for? Because me, when I started doing that, I'd say, okay, here's what I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm doing this. I think, well, who's this for? Not, well, this one's for me. You know, doing something else. Who's this really for? Think about it, honest with myself. Well, this one's for me. You know, later on, I'm doing this. Who's this really for? It kind of looked like it was for someone else, but really, it's actually, wow, what a coincidence. This is for me, too. 
You know, and about the thousandth time, I start realizing, how am I loving God and loving others if everything I do is for me? It'll take you realizing that, God's showing you that, pressing on your heart and saying, okay, God, I want to serve you. You know, I'm like Paul, though. I want to do what's good, but I just keep doing what's wrong. God knows your heart. God's grace is much bigger than any of our sin. All he wants is for you to turn to him and say, God, cleanse me, forgive me, change me. I want to walk in the light. I want to be a child of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your clear, um, undeniable word. And Lord, we just humbly admit that uh, uh, without you, we're a wreck. And right now, Lord, even now, every person in this room and myself, I pray that you would forgive us the wickedness that dwells in our heart, that you would just cleanse it out right now. You would give us a glimpse of what it's like to truly walk through life without loving the world, without loving ourselves, without hating others, that we would truly be able to open our eyes spiritually to see your light. And Lord, we know that we can't do it on our own, but yet we know you call us to and you want us to. So we pray for your strength and your power. And Lord, I thank you so much for this church and Lord, for allowing me to be able to teach what it is that, that I need to learn. Jesus, we love you. And Lord, I do lift up to you any person in this room that maybe doesn't know you right now. Even now, I pray that as they heard your gospel, they would repent and believe. We love you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys.